All right, so it is my honor to have Dr. John McDougall on with us today. Um, so thanks for coming, Dr. McDougall. Well, good. It was nice all the way from across the coast. Can you imagine that? What technology. Isn't this unbelievable? Yeah. That you can just sit and have a conversation with somebody you know, 5,000 miles away and be almost like real. Yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. Dr. McDougall, you're at the vanguard of medicine today. Um, and it, it's funny to even say that because what you prescribe is nothing crazy. As Hippocrates said, let food be that medicine, and that's what you're practicing. So basically, just share with us, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and uh, your work. Well, thank you. I, uh, you know, I occasionally look at myself, as you do, which is somebody who's leading medicine and nutritional science. But most of the time, I look at myself as somebody who is being ignored. And, uh, and in all honesty, I can tell you that what I do is in no way original. Uh, you mentioned Hippocrates. Well, you know, I like to go back to a guy named Daniel who wrote a, uh, a story in the Bible, in the first chapter of Daniel, that pretty much describes what I do. In fact, exactly describes what I do in a controlled experiment. Not that I want to start out with a religious note with you especially. I just think history is important. And this was 2,500 years ago. Daniel wrote about his men who were sick because they were eating the king's food. They were living in the king's castle and eating the king's food. And Daniel asked the gatekeeper if he could do a controlled, and this was a controlled experiment, where he took three of his men, put them on a diet of pulses of water, in other words, vegetables and water, and, and compared them with a group. So in other words, his men were the intervention group compared them with the men who maintained themselves on the king's food. Now what he declared in a sentence uh, in the first chapter of Daniel is that the, the men who switched to pulses of water were much healthier and younger looking than those who continued to eat the rich food. So that's essentially what I do is I take people who are sick because they eat uh, like kings and queens. And this could be in societies throughout history and also societies throughout the world. This is nothing unique to Americans or to people in, uh, in Europe. This is uh, something that's unique to rich people who abandon their native, natural, common diet of starch. In other words, rice, corn, potatoes, beans, peas, and lentils, and sweet potatoes. And I, I want to say that again because otherwise the rest of the conversation is going to be lost on the audience is that uh, what people traditionally ate and should be eating now and what the human diet is and will always be is a diet primarily made up of starches, rice, corn, potatoes, bean, peas, lentils, sweet potatoes, those kinds of foods cooked, not raw, but cooked with the addition, you know, as it works out with small amounts because these are tough to get and seasonal small amounts of non-starchy vegetables like broccoli and kale and lettuce, and cauliflower, etc., and uh, fruits, which again are very seasonal. So that's the diet of the human being. Now the human being uh, in all of history, as far as I know, was never a vegan, uh, except by circumstance and some religious uh, followings. Uh, human beings always threw in some animal food here and there whenever they could get it wasn't necessary, may have been beneficial. I'm not saying that uh, for sure it wasn't. I think today that's a whole new story because our animal foods are so dirty. But uh, in times of past, uh, there certainly, uh, not certainly, there could have been some advantages to adding a little animal food here and there. The reason I don't now is because people can't, not only because it's dirty, but also they can't control themselves. The animal foods are so accessible if you tell somebody, for example, one of my patients, that they can have a little animal food, say a little chicken, a little turkey, or a little pork, they don't understand a little. And they just, you know, they just, uh, once you remove the barriers, they can't stop. And so it's mostly a behavioral issue these days, which I'm going to talk more about, and why I teach the diet is black and white. Not because it has to be practiced that way. I think it's more beneficial in our times with the condition of our people to be practiced that way. But behaviorally, it's impossible for people to do moderation a little bit, sensible. They can't do it. So anyway, uh, uh, 
understanding that uh, some people do feel that I'm a leader in medicine and nutrition these days. Those people are few. <laughs> and when they show up, I uh, kind of put them in perspective and certainly do realize there are lots of people who came before me and my philosophy is old, it's ancient, it's nothing new. And I stand on the shoulders of many men also who taught the same kind of philosophy. And most recently, for those of you who want to look into it, you want to study the teachings of Roy Swank from Oregon Health and Science University who treated multiple sclerosis with the kind of diet I recommend. Dennis Burkett, who is known as the Fiber Man, who is from England, who made observations on 10 million people over a 17-year period of time in Uganda, Africa, and found that American diseases don't exist or did not exist at that time in his population, and a, and a, a, real, uh, a real healer, a man who really did practice medicine even though he was not a doctor, and that was Nathan Pritikin. So anybody interested in some of the background uh, that I speak from will look up these three men and you'll again, you'll decide, well, what McDougall teaches is not original. It really isn't. Uh, I, uh, from my personal point of view, I'm a board certified internist. I'm licensed in five states to practice medicine. I have pretty much an unblemished record in terms of the legal medical malpractice issues. Uh, that, of course, doesn't have to uh, continue. Uh, maybe when I do get popular and well-known and influential, that will change. People will come out and attack me and try and hurt me, and that's just the way the world is. But right now, you know, my uh, record is pretty much unblemished. My reputation, likewise, is uh, pretty much unblemished. I think um, uh, most people, they look at what I see, and they see the validity of it, and when they look up the science, they realize it's absolutely concrete and true. Not necessarily do people like what I have to say. They don't. There are a lot of folks that I hurt, uh, particularly when it comes to the medical business, when I talk about mammograms and heart bypass surgery, when it comes to the nutrition business, when I talk about how uneducated, how ignorant uh, dietitians are and anybody else who is so-called learned in the field of nutrition. Uh, they're basically have missed a whole aspect of human nutrition. Sure, they're good at biochemical reactions and vitamin supplements to treat scurvy and pellagra and beriberi, but they have no idea how to prevent and treat heart disease and type 2 diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis, etc. So those people who think they are very well educated, and certainly they are degreed, I realize they have an RD or some other degree, uh, they get upset with me. And of course the food industry, uh, what we're talking about is the animal food industry and the processed food industries, particularly the oil industries like the olive oil industry, they have no reason to like me at all either. When I say like me, I don't mean from a personal point of view. I mean from an ideological point of view. Where I came from was a traditional medical background. I had some life-changing experience. One is I had terrible health when I was a young person uh, until about age 28 when I changed my diet. I had a massive stroke. I had, uh, well, I guess you'd call it borderline obesity. I'm a hundred fewer than 160 pounds as I sit before you. But my top weight was 230. I run a cholesterol these days in the 137 to 151 range. And I used to run a cholesterol over 330. Yeah. Uh, so I, I was in very bad health. I had a major abdominal surgery in my 20s. I was destined to die soon. But fortunately, I had some uh, experiences on the positive side. In addition to medical school, which of course was invaluable, to teach me the basics so I can learn the rest of the story. I uh, was a family practitioner, a, a plantation doctor on the Big Island of Hawaii where I took care of 5,000 people. And essentially I was their doctor. Uh, there was uh, nobody else around for 41 miles to help out. I had to take care of these people. If they had babies, I caught their babies. If they <clears throat> Had accidents. Uh, I took care of their accidents, their injuries. I did brain surgery in the middle of the night. I did whatever it took to patch these people back together. I also pushed drugs, which uh, even at that time I knew weren't effective. I didn't really understand they weren't effective or why, but I, I could tell watching what happened to my patients. I pushed drugs on my patients and surgery on my patients, which uh, were disappointing 
in their outcomes. Always disappointing. I thought that it was just me because, I mean, how could there be such a big lie out there about how you uh, heal people with these medications and surgeries for chronic disease? How could, how could it pers persist, this big lie? How could it be so universally accepted? I must be making bad observations is what I thought. Uh, but my patients never got better when I treated them with common drugs for cholesterol and high blood pressure and diabetes. I mean, the numbers got better, but they never got better. They just stayed fat and sick. Likewise, with the surgeries they sent them off to, they often came back worse than when I sent them. Now, there are some surgeries that are of value. If you're bleeding to death, you certainly want a surgeon around. If you have an infection, you certainly want the surgeon to lance the abscess. There are drugs that are wonderful, too, like antibiotics. So uh, You can't condemn the entire business of surgery and pharmaceuticals, but you can condemn most of it for chronic disease. I mean, you can condemn essentially all of it for chronic disease. Where we, uh, where we do well in medicine is when it comes to acute problems like lacerations, infections, and so on. But we do terrible in chronic disease. That's why they call it chronic disease. People never get better. So anyway, I, uh, I have had a lot of good fortune in life in terms of having good experiences, having a very supportive family, having had what they call a tough skin, and also having had the luxury of people not criticizing me to my face. Uh, my critics always remain behind my back. They will not face me on stage. It has been that way for the last 35 years, whether they be medical, like medical doctors, or they be uh, uh, health food gurus that write uh, cookbooks and other so-called science books. Uh, these people will not meet me publicly. It may have been just by circumstances that I never met them over the last 35 years, even though I've been on in the past, distant past, been on all major radio and television shows. Not recently, because, uh, you know, it doesn't seem that my message is of much value these days in terms of that kind of publicity. Instead, they'd rather talk about eating as many animals as you could possibly eat and enhance global warming as fast as you can enhance it. That seems to be the, the uh, most popular subject these days, regardless whether it's the truth or not. You want to tell your listening audience and your reading audience that they can eat as much garbage as they want to shove in the mouth. People like that. They love to hear good news about their bad habits and habits and industry controls everything. I mean, <laughs> you don't have to be talking about the food industry or the medical industry. You can talk about whatever industry you're in. is big business, whether it be big pharma or big food or big tobacco or big alcohol. They control everything. We have come to that day that was predicted when I was a young man where uh, you know business runs the world, plain and simple. Uh, dissenting opinions are very, very, very hard to find and hard to believe because why in the world would some lowly individual be telling the truth when everybody else says the opposite? And I can understand the confused consumer, except for I'd ask the consumer, now we're talking about medical and uh, nutrition care, I'd ask the consumer to look in the mirror, and as they do, drag out their buckets of pills and say, if what you believe worked, you wouldn't look like that, you wouldn't be taking all these pills. So there are a few people out there that can face reality and say, it's not working for me. No, it's not working for me, and maybe I should listen to somebody else. I just want to state uh, for uh, everybody's assurance that I am optimistic because I have two things on my side that they don't have. I have the truth, which does count. Does count. Yeah, and I have success on my side, too. My patients get well, and we publish the results individually, mostly on the Internet through my website, and sometimes in medical journals we publish the results, and sometimes we have universities involved in the studies. So uh, messages out there, and again, it's not an original message. You can go and find tens of thousands of articles I'm under-exaggerating. You can find many more than tens of thousands of articles to support the fact that current-day medicine is a disaster in terms of results, not financially, but in terms of patient outcomes. Whether you're talking about multiple sclerosis medications, rheumatoid arthritis medications, bypass surgery, cancer therapy, 
and this, by the way, is old news. It's been going on for four or five decades that I've been in medicine. It's not new. Everything's the same. But they get away with it because nobody will stand up and say anything about it. Consistently, uh, the research shows the truth. Consistently, if you fix the problem, which is the food, you know, the food that Daniel's man, men gave up 2,500 years ago, that the king's men continue to eat. If you stop doing that, people lose weight, they get well, you know, everything gets fixed, the doctors go out of business, big, big pharma starves, the food industry doesn't get to sell their most profitable products, which are billions of chickens, and uh, all the fish that are left in the oceans, which are very few. Paleo diet, I've written about that, I think it was in, I don't know, maybe 2003. You'll find it on my website. Just look under Paleo Diet. I wrote about Lauren Cordain. This is nothing personal. Lauren Cordain is the father of the Paleo Diet, so to speak. He has his PhD in something. Uh, commits very, very serious medical errors in his book. But his diet philosophy also is uh, extremely flawed from many points of view. But let's, uh, everything I say about the Paleo Diet, you can relate back to Lauren Cordain's book called the Paleo Diet. And uh, that's, that's the reference. And, uh, and you can also read the newsletter. You can find the exact quotes to what I'm going to say in the newsletter. That's on my website, drmcdougall.com. Uh, the Paleo Diet is an idea that we were hunter-gatherers with an emphasis on hunting. As a result, uh, the Paleo people taught, teach, whatever. Paleo is a, a very movable type of philosophy. Uh, these days, it's kind of moving towards starch-based diets. But the traditional Paleo diet taught that you should eat 55% of your food from animal sources, excluding dairy. And when we talk about animals, we talk about rattlesnakes and beavers and you know, probably skunks, whatever, fish, anything that uh, that basically breathe, you can eat and should eat. 55% of your diet comes from animals. Well, uh, the first problem is is that uh, there have been three meta-analyses done. One was published in Animals and Internal Medicine, the other one is PLOS1, and I forget where the third is, but you can find all those references in my January 2014 newsletter. But there have been three large melon analyses, only three, which show when you eat these kinds of diets, low in carbohydrate, high in protein, you increase the risk of death and disease. Only three studies done. Uh, the research dating back to Daniel, but particularly over the last 100 years, shows that eating animal, these animal foods uh, give you cancer and heart disease and bone loss and kidney stones and so on. That's what the research says, unless you have enough money to manipulate it, which is what the dairy and meat industry have. And they hire their scientists to put new spins on old evidence. And they do, and they fool they fool uh, willing doctors, scientists, and uh, dietitians. They have to be willing because uh, they have to overlook so much of the truth to be convinced that these spin doctors are correct. So anyways, the science says that this is an extremely unhealthy diet. Uh, no question about it. Just from the point of view of environmental contaminants, just the fact that it's dirty, in other words, high on the food chain, and dirty, high on listeria and mad cow. Even the fish have mad cow in them. I mean, even from that point of view, you would say this has to be wrong. So it's unhealthy. It's untrue, which I told you, because... Science says the opposite of what they say it says. <laughs> and it's uncivilized. It's uncivilized to eat the planet to death. You know, these low carvers, uh, they can take and spin their science in front of people if they want uh, on a stage. As I say, they've not done it with me yet. Who knows why? But they can spin it, they can spin it like they want in terms of, well, our science shows this and that. And uh, these days, of course, with people who have these handheld devices, they can check out the science while the audience is sitting there. What they say is we're hunter-gatherers with the emphasis on hunting because that's what archaeology teaches. That's false. Uh, the archaeology that's been done over the last 20 years clearly shows that we're starch eaters. Unless you get to the extremes in the environment up, say, where the Eskimos live. Uh, in those extremes, of course, people eat from the environment and they're mostly meat eaters. But you take a people from the uh, chilly North Atlantic to the steamy, hot Mediterranean, and you look at their their bones and uh, their living environment, 
way back then, going back to uh, two and a half million years ago, but particularly 105,000 years ago in Mozambique, 44,000 years ago involving Neanderthals, 30,000 years ago involving studies of people in Czechoslovakia, Russia, and Italy, all very well published, and Peru 8,000 years ago, and, uh, and down south of Santiago, Chile, uh, 14,000 years. I mean, you just go on and what you find is that uh, the philosophy of hunter gathering uh, is not supported by scientific literature when it supports hunting. People were gatherers. And you see that in all kinds of evidence, particularly starch granules that's found between teeth and all over the place. So it's untrue. They are basically lying. And I say they're lying because you can't miss the truth if you read the archaeological literature or talk to any of the experts in uh, biologic anthropology. They all tell you that this is BS, that we were primarily hunters, except in the extremes of the environment. Now, why do they teach this philosophy? Well, it fits in with something called sexism, gender bias, sexism. It's been going on for a few years, to say the least. Who did the gathering? The gathering was done by grandparents, children, and women. No glory there. Who did the hunting? It was the men who left out on their adventure. Two weeks later, they found a dead carcass and brought it back before it rotted. Maybe they did not supply sufficient calories for the people to survive, except for the extremes of the environment. But anyway, sexism lives on in your office place, in your school, and so on. Now, that's why it's untrue. As far as the environment is concerned, we, we are, regardless of your uh, global, global warming, climate change deniers, well, uh, it's, it's the same thing with the food. Uh, there are people who deny everything except they can't deny the fact that eating animals is environmentally devastating. The World Health Organization said this in their report in November 2006, a report called Livestock's Long Shadow. Uh, the World uh, World Watch Institute said that 51% of our global warming gases are produced by eating animals. World Health Organization said it was 18%. So the effect on the environment in terms of global warming gases, in terms of uh, pollution, deforestation, etc., are huge and undeniable. So. My point of view, and by the way, Lauren Cordain said this too in his book called The Paleo Diet. If you look at the end of the addendum, he says if people on Earth were to follow the Paleo Diet, nine out of ten people would have to be eliminated from planet Earth just to support the food supply. So pick nine of ten of your friends and family and give them a suicide pill because if we're going to be on a Paleo Diet, that's what has to happen. You have to depopulate planet Earth immediately. Anyway, uh, I think the paleo philosophy is slowly dying. It's tied in heavily financially with CrossFit, which I don't know anything about. But I hear it's a pretty brutal exercise regime. But I do know for secondhand information, I haven't taken the trouble to look it up, that they are tied in heavily with uh, paleo CrossFitters. Well, that's, that's basically where paleo goes, and uh, now new paleo people are saying, well, actually ancient folks ate potatoes if they were from uh, South America. Remember, the Incas lived on potatoes, and they ate uh, corn and beans if they were in C uh, Central America. The Aztecs and the Mayans lived on corn and beans, and the American Indian, yeah, they lived on uh, corn. Yeah, they did. And the people in Asia, the paleo people now say, oh yeah, they lived on rice. And the paleo people now recognize that the Middle East is the breadbasket of the world and always has been, where they lived on barley and wheat. Yeah, the paleo people are finally, some of them, looking into the science and revising the paleo diet to make it a little bit more humane, a little healthier, a little bit more true, a little bit more environmentally friendly, but they still have that kickback. They can still go eat their dead animals. And I don't think they're going to give that up and take the big step, which says that 
just for the uh, viewpoint of success, whether it's an individual patient or a society, we have to not say we're going to cut down on animals. We have to say we're going to eliminate animal food consumption, period, black and white, just like we say in a society like ours. We're going to eliminate tobacco use, particularly with children. I mean, it's just there's no tolerance when it comes to tobacco. In uh, public policy, health policy, governmental policy, it's like, no. And uh, anybody serious about alcoholism will tell you the same thing. It's, no. Anybody who got serious about health or the environment in terms of food, they'd say, no. You can't eat those foods. Why aren't these people exposed? Right. Like Barry Sears. And Robert Atkins gave us a wheat belly. Why aren't they exposed? Well, Jamie, they are in a sense. Every time they get on stage where there's a video camera, they are exposed. Because when you look at the health of Cordain, William Davis, Sally Fallon, Barry Sears, you, you can't miss it if your eyes are open. These are fat, not mildly overweight. These are grossly fat. We're talking about their physical parents, sickly looking people. So they're exposed. It's just the audience. Some of them are sitting there thinking, well, they're just like me. They're fat. I can relate to them. What supplement are they taking? You know, and uh, so it's, it's, it's the mind of the viewer. And plus, they control the money. I mean, not these people individually, exactly. But I'm sure the meat, dairy, and fish industries are not upset about their messages. Well, they've never tried, and they've never opened their eyes to world history. Now, uh, I believe that they can't eat enough potatoes and that without getting really thin, or live on 90% uh, of their diet as rice, as the Asians did up until 1980. Now, in China, Vietnam, Thailand, up until about 1980, about... Uh, you know, close to 90% of their calories came from rice, and every, everybody was thin, hardworking, active. I mean, consider we almost lost a war, or we did lose a war to the Vietnamese. We almost lost a war to the Japanese, who, who were fueled by rice. So these are strong, hardy uh, people living on almost all their diet is rice. And there's not a fat person, not a single fat person in your history books in among these populations of rice eaters. So yeah, I, I, I can understand you can't eat that much rice because you don't want to. But if that's all there was, you would. Now, if that's what your only choice, you would. Uh, you can't eat that many potatoes because you don't want to. But if that's all there was, you would. And the result would be you'd be very trim. Your acne would go away. Your bowel movements would start working again. Your ulcers would disappear. Your arthritis would improve dramatically and only the residual deformity would be left. All the active arthritis would go away. Your arteries would clean out and leave you with just a few scars in your arteries. That's what would happen. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I can understand that you can't eat that many potatoes and you can't eat that much rice, but it's not for the reasons you think. It's only because you don't want to because the potatoes are cheap. You go to Costco and you look at uh, 20 pounds of potatoes, what is it like, nine bucks? And you look for uh, 50 pounds of white rice. Not that white rice is my preferred rice. 50 pounds of white rice is like $20, $25. Yeah, and I see people struggling. That's one of the harder things that I watch these days, <clears throat> is I see people uh, struggling to make ends meet. I will go to Costco on occasion. I remember a trip I went there about a month ago, and Mary and I are standing in line behind a Latino family. Three kids, mom and dad. Mom and dad are overweight. The kids are bordering on uh, overweight. And I'm watching the, uh, the ticker, you know, uh, the cashier add up the food that these people are buying, and eventually they got $300. And the woman said, that's enough. We can't afford it anymore. We have to put the rest back. Well, it was, it was basically meat and dairy. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I should go up and, and give these people a lecture uh, they could have bought that many calories for their family, and the family would be healthy. They could have bought it on, you know, a quarter or maybe, uh, well, certainly many fractions less money. That $300 would have gone to supply them lots of beans and rice and vegetables and fruits. 
as opposed to what looked like a week's worth of uh, animal foods. You know, so it's, it's a tragedy on, on so many levels for people to be miseducated. And uh, to continue to perpetuate this, in my opinion, is criminal. And someday, just because you haven't objected to what I have to say, Jamie, I will tell you how I really feel. Someday, I believe the medical doctors, the pharmaceutical companies, uh, the uh, salespeople of all these animal foods and garbage will have to face the uh, same judge and jury that the tobacco industry faced several years ago. They almost went to jail for lying to the public about tobacco. They probably should have. Yeah, I think they should have. And when the hearings come up again for those who perpetrated these lies and this suffering, which is far greater than tobacco, far greater than tobacco, the food damage, the environment, oh, doesn't even measure on the same scale, to human health, to obesity, to the economy, far, far greater in scale than what tobacco ever did or alcohol ever did. When these people in these industries come to judgment day, if, if people are fair, if they really take into account what they've done and, uh, and the, uh, the actions they took based upon the knowledge they have right now and have had for decades, these people will go to jail. Yes, they will. These parents are, are good people. I mean, they're policemen, they're teachers, they're ministers. They're good people. They just don't know any better. And I think most people, when they discover the truth, will take action to help their children. Most people. I mean, you find very few parents encouraging their kids to smoke tobacco or illicit drugs. I mean, there are a few. Or to drink alcohol. You find very few. If uh, the parents were taught the truth, why their families are sick, and dying. I think most parents are given a chance, in other words, some education. This is not as easy as quitting cigarettes. you got to learn how to cook differently, new restaurants to find. If they were given, given, say, probably the easiest restaurant to change over right now would be Taco Bell. And you go to Taco Bell and actually find some fairly healthy things on, on occasion. Uh, Low-fat, more whole beans. In fact, you can find whole black beans at Taco Bell. But just to say, uh, I think it's PepsiCo owns Taco Bell. Just say uh, they decided, well, okay, we're going to have a, a Taco Bell healthy series of restaurants. And we're going to charge uh, the food appropriately, and we're going to advertise to the public in full scale what the difference is between McDonald's and Burger King, the way they serve the food now, and what Taco Bell new healthy serves. I think parents would respond especially if the education was at the intensity it deserves, I think they'd respond. Now, what's going on now is child abuse. It is truly child abuse. If there were uh, families out there in our country uh, who let their children become skin and bones, look like uh, refugees from a concentration camp, and there was food available in the kitchen and the parents weren't giving that food to the children, they would be arrested. This is child abuse. Uh, if the pain that's caused by the food, like the severe pain in their rectum uh, from fissures, anal fissures, the arthritis they have in their joints, uh, the headaches they have, the stomach aches they have, if that was caused by a parent flailing a stick at the child, they would put that parent in jail. But it's caused by a fork and spoon, and people aren't educated. But it still hurts. I mean, the kids, the kids still hurt. Uh, the kids still suffer terrible ridicule in class because they're fat, they have acne and oily skin, and they stink terrible. They stink like a dying animal or a dead animal. The kids can't perform on the athletic field because they don't have the fuel necessary to run the race. So they suffer terrible ridicule. That's painful. Now, if the parents were well aware of what they were doing to their children and had the means to do otherwise, if this kind of behavior continued, you know society would react appropriately. But that's not what's going on. The parents don't know. They don't know the alternative. Uh, uh, they're good people acting, uh, acting harmfully to their kids because of ignorance. We could fix all that. And when that's fixed, uh, there would be just a few nasty people, as there are now, out there doing acts of evil. Right now, there are lots of people doing act acts of evil, but not intentionally. 
I, I can't speak to exactly what Dr. Graham or the 101080 diet teaches, so that's that's one disadvantage I have. <clears throat> but let me see if I can answer your question in terms of uh, something that I do know about. Is uh, what do I think about people who are interested in nutrient dense diets? Uh, diets that emphasize non starchy green and yellow vegetables and fruits and minimize the intake of starch. They teach a starch based diet with a, a smaller amount of intake of non starchy, like broccoli, kale, lettuce, celery, uh, small intake, not, not elimination, but small intake of those non starchy vegetables and a small intake of fruit, say zero to three or four fruits a day, is my general recommendation. So uh, uh, there are other people who change those proportions around. So as your question, uh, what do I think about people who de-emphasize starch and emphasize nutrient-dense, not starchy vegetables? Uh, I think uh, that uh, these people are acting contrary to what all populations have done in all of human history. No population has ever lived on a diet of fruit or non-starchy green and vegetables. Never happened, never will happen, never could happen. It would be unaffordable, it would be environmentally uh, 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 it would be environmentally impossible, it would be uh, impossible from a farming point of view to do. You could not do it. Uh, because you just can't grow enough cabbage to feed people. I mean, even a small amount of people, it takes 11 to 25 pounds of cabbage to get the calories an individual needs daily. So it would be impossible to do in any natural society. Now, when you have a society that's fueled by fossil fuel and uh, the Industrial Revolution uh, uh, inventions that we have, and you can produce food in, uh, in unheard of quantities and qualities like at Safeway and Whole Foods and Times Market, when you can do that, yet yeah, people can do something really unnatural, like eat, try and eat a diet of celery and broccoli and kale, etc. They can try, but they don't succeed. If they truly did do that, uh, they would spend a good bulk of their day, day eating. They would be starving. Starving. I mean, they would feel like they're starving, and plus they'd have grumbly stomachs. I've seen this. I take care of people at my clinic all the time. In fact, I take care of 60 people each clinic, myself personally. And I see some of them come in with this diet mentality that they're going to eat lots of salads and raw vegetables. And they are, uh, they are unhappy campers. Third, fourth day, I say, sit down with many of them. I say, look, don't you get this? You must eat. You must get satisfied. Now, some people who realize that this is a, uh, an impossible thing to do, to live on... Uh, non-starchy green and yellow vegetables, uh, they look for a calorie source because they're not going to add starch. I mean, to add starch would be just different than they ever believed to be true. So they're not going to add starch. So what do they add for a, non, uh, for a non-starch calorie source? They add nuts and seeds. And then what you do is you front, put in front of people a food that contains 80% of its calories as fat. And it doesn't offer the satisfaction that people need. Uh, see, carbohydrates satisfies the hunger drive. So people are eating this, these low-carb, high-fat nuts and seeds, and they just can't stop. And so you end up with fat vegans. Uh, anyway, I don't know what the underlying intentions are of people who go in those directions of a low-starch diet. But they're wrong. The results of their treatment are obvious that they are wrong because people don't get well, they don't stay with the program. Now, of course, there are exceptions. There are exceptions to everything. But by and large, I have seen these people over the last 30 years, their this kind of philosophy goes back many years. It's pervasive, not in just the 10-10-80 diet you mentioned. There are other people out there that have retained, attained some notoriety who teach a low-starch diet. But I can, I can just tell you, it ain't never been done, it, it, it never will be done in any population of people ever on earth. It is environmentally uh, unfriendly. It is, uh, from a farming point of view, impossible. I've met a few fruitarians, short term, but I know of no population of human beings who have ever lived on fruit. Is it possible? Yeah. Is it desirable? 
from many points of view, no. You get my point of view. Um, so that's what I think about it, and then maybe the nice thing to say about people who have this nutrient-dense, low-starch, vegan, plant food-based point of view is they do bring people closer to the truth so that when their eyes are open, they can see that all large, successful populations of people throughout all of verifiable human history have obtained the bulk of their calories from starch. That is an undeniable fact. So, yeah. Where can people find more information about you and what you're working well, on? The most important resource I have is a website that's almost all free in terms of its recipes, information, videos, free. You will not be disappointed. And I, I would go there. It's uh, drmcdougall.com, which is D-R-M-C-D-O-U-G-A-L-L. So it's www.drmcdougall.com. And there's a, a wealth of information. Everything I told you in terms of the diet, treating diabetes, treating uh, hypertension, constipations there, indigestion, et cetera, heart disease, it's all there free. So I just go there. And uh, www.drmcdougall.com. And if you like, you know, what I have to say, a good summary is in the book that you started talking about at the beginning called The Starch Solution. I've written uh, 13 national best-selling books. And, uh, you know, I've, I've had uh, my share of media exposure. Hopefully it'll get bigger these days thanks, thanks to you and your efforts. And more and more people will hear what I believe to be the truth.